Well, Australia is a uniquely diverse nation. 46% of the population have at least one parent who was born overseas, and nearly 20% speak a language other than English at home. But understanding, and more importantly, respecting other cultures can be daunting. Sometimes even just knowing the right thing to say is confusing, and it can feel like we are tiptoeing around a cultural minefield. So this morning on today's agenda, we are discussing cultural sensitivity in Australia in 2019. And I'm thrilled that joining me to discuss this is CEO of The Remarkable Woman, Shivani Gopal, and our very own Brooke Boney. Hello and welcome Hello. to you both. Hello. Shivani, um, I guess for many of us it is difficult to gauge the differences between what is and isn't sensitive. Mm. Um, for example, you are a proud Fijian Indian. Yes, I am. And you are described as a woman of colour. Yes. First off, is that okay to describe you in that way as a woman of, of colour? Like, is that acceptable? It totally is. And I always say to people, you know, I'm a brown woman or I'm a Fijian Indian woman. I'm a proud Fijian Indian Australian woman. What's not OK is to call me an exotic woman. <laughs> <laughs> you get that? I get that a yeah. lot. And people will say, and, and they think that that's rather OK, Shivani, I'll call you exotic rather than brown. And I say I'm brown. Feel free to call me brown because when you say I'm exotic, you're saying that I'm different. When I look in the mirror, I don't see someone who's different. I see a brown woman, I see a woman of rich cultural heritage, but I don't see me as inherently different to you. So that's when you start to alienate and create differences. So lean towards colour or cultural heritage, don't go towards exotic. I'm not a, I'm not a coffee blend. <laughs> Perfectly put. That will never happen again, I hope. Um, Brooke, you describe yourself as a... Help me with the pronunciation. So, a Gamilaroi woman. Gamilaroi so woman. So, that's where my family are from, which is in northern New South Wales, like around Moree, Inverell, around that area. And that is equivalent to me saying I'm West Australian or I'm from yeah, Perth. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the area where you were born. Yeah, well, I wasn't born there, but that's where my family is from. So I grew up on Wanneroo country, which is in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. And it's, it's more like if you think of Australia, um, like previously, as having sort of boundaries like European, like uh, in Europe. So European countries all sort of being split up and, and having different languages and different cultural practices. So that's sort of what I mean when I say I'm a Gamilaroi woman. And what are your thoughts when we talk about cultural sensitivity in Australia? Are we falling behind? Have we still got a lot to learn? I think we've got a lot to learn, but I think we've come a very long way as well. And I, I think, you know, the rule with cultural sensitivity is if you don't have anything nice to say, then just don't say anything at all. My mum used to say that to us when we were little. And, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, should I be saying that or should I not be saying that? I think that you just sort of take your own guidance. You know, like I always joke when people are like, oh, what sort of traditional food do you know how to make? And I'm like, um, well, Devon sandwiches with tomato sauce. Like, that's what we used to eat when I was growing up. Or, like, um, you know, we were joking about um, fake tans uh, a couple of months ago. And I was like, oh, I've never had a fake tan. And, you know, it's OK to laugh along when I'm sort of making that joke. What's not OK is making jokes at other people's expense yeah. or joking about things, um, you know, that have, uh, you know, forced a group of people to be oppressed or, yeah. or disadvantaged. Yeah. You know, making fun of others, you know, by saying mean comments is not OK. Because you were, you were so gracious with me, I remember about a month ago, I think I just, in, just said to you, oh, you've got the most beautiful skin, meaning it was just clear and blemish-free because I'm covered in sunspots. And, 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 and suddenly I thought, oh, gosh, is that OK for me to say that? And you put me at ease straight away. But can you understand that people do feel p particularly cautious about how yeah. they mm. express themselves when it comes to talking totally. about skin? Yeah, I think that, you know, there is this idea that, you know, things have gone too PC or too far in one direction. But I think just, you know, you're a lovely person and I know that you would never say anything that would intentionally sort of hurt my feelings and when you said that I definitely just took it as a compliment I thought you know make a joke at my own expense I got my fake tan in the womb <laughs> my mom's got quite dark skin um, but I think you know if you if you mean well and you're approaching someone with genuine kindness and curiosity and and you're not trying to romanticize them by saying things about them being exotic or, or anything that's othering I think that you know that's generally pretty safe territory. Mm. Mm. Shivani, I'd love to talk to you about where we um, where we draw the line between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. Yes. Explain the difference and what you've experienced on that front. Yeah, I think it's a really fine line. And relative to what Brooke said, the intent and the 
outcome is really important. So when it comes to appropriation, the first thing that's really important is to understand what appropriation actually is. And as a, as a general term, I'd say it's someone from a privileged background adopting another person's culture for fame, for gain, or because they think it's cool to do so. Mm. And if I were to give you an example, it would be Rihanna who once um, posed in front of a mosque in a really kind of provocative way. Because when you do that, you're taking and you're stripping away all of its cultural richness and heritage, the battles that are hard won, and it can be deeply painful and hurtful for the people who come from that culture. Mm. So. When appropriation happens, it generally happens because of ignorance, it happens because of malice or lack of understanding. And so when we talked about cultural sensitivity a little while ago, the caveat that I would put to that is sometimes cultural sensitivity goes a little bit too far and it does make people a little bit afraid from asking really important questions. Mm. And I would encourage people to ask about my cultural her heritage. By that I don't mean to ask me where I'm from, because I'll tell you I'm from Sydney, because I'm, I'm a proud Australian mm. woman as well, right? Mm. But if you ask me what I love about my culture, what I would love to share with you about it, you would learn so much more and you'd be less likely to culturally appropriate and you'd be more likely to be on the side of cultural appreciation where you're celebrating my culture with me and you're doing it from a place of deep understanding because you've been able to enculturate through the rich texture mm. and, and context that I have then given you. So Brooke, with that, are there instances, though, where we've just gone way too far? I know I interviewed Joanna Lumley recently and she made the remark about how you can't even put a sombrero on now without people being <laughs> offended. And as she said, it's a sombrero, people. Like, you know, w w what are your thoughts on that? Have we all become way too overzealous? Um, look, I think that there probably are instances where people are very, very sensitive about things, but it's probably rooted in the fact that for a very long time the things that made us different um, and that people made fun of, you know, things like, uh, you know, having an afro or, you know, having a really dark skin or, you know, wearing a bindi or mm. whatever, people would have been like, oh, that's different, we're making fun of that. And now people are like, oh, we're just going to cherry pick the sexy parts of your culture mm. and we're going to use them for ourselves without actually acknowledging what, you know, what the struggles are or, you know, the fact that you're oppressed. And one really good example recently was um, in Ricky Gervais's new, um, new show and... Um, in it, there's a, a beautiful big Aboriginal artwork, what appears to be an yes. Aboriginal artwork hanging in the background. Yeah. And one of my friends, Danny Tease Johnson, thought, oh, wow, they, you know, they've got this incredible artwork in the back. I'm going to find out who the artist is. It's surely some sort of central Australian incredible artist who, you know, we should all be congratulating right now. He looked into it and it was actually an English woman who was inspired by Aboriginal art. And the reason that that is, you know, just very difficult is because a lot of those symbols and traditions are rooted in, um, you know, in our culture and in the processes of, you know, growing as a man or growing as a woman. And, and, and practicing culture. Mm. Yes. Also, you know, when you're talking about um, people in these communities who maybe don't have a lot of streams of income and you're, you know, adopting their cultural practices for your own personal benefit and gain and they're sort of like languishing in, in poverty, yeah. it just seems like a really mean thing to do to someone who you're inspired by. Yeah. Well, the definition of appropriation, isn't it? They've mm. used your culture for gain when yeah. they've already got so much privilege. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes for such interesting discussion and um, you are both just so well placed to talk about this. I've learned a lot and I hope our viewers at home have as well. Thank you both. Thank you, George. Power to the two of you. <laughs> Thank you.